Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Zoom worship service. We begin, as usual, by acknowledging that the land on which our homes and our church were built was not uninhabited when European settlers arrived here with their ideas of conquest and ownership. For those of us who live in Moscow, Pullman, or other nearby communities, we live on the ancestral homelands of the Nimipu, called Nez Perce by the French-speaking traders, the Palouse, and the Shitshumsh, called the Kirtalane. If you are joining us from another place, I encourage you to discover who inhabited or moved through the place where you now live in the times before colonization and genocide. And we pause for just a moment and remember that we live on ground that is sacred, ground that was stolen, ground that cries out for justice and for responsible stewardship. May our remembering help us find the courage to do our part and now let's join our voices together for our words of welcome, our unison chalice lighting, and our song affirmation. Please say these words with me. Whoever you are, wherever you've come from, whatever your beliefs, whomever you love, and however bumpy your life's journey, know that you are welcome here. We're hoping that you have a chalice or a candle to light and something to light it with. Let's take a moment and light our chalices together. Hello from the Gibbler family, Marissa, Avi, and Lowy. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek and seek to share. Again, good morning. I want to extend a special welcome today to our guest, Steve Holly. Steve comes to us at the invitation of the Green Sanctuary Committee. He's an environmental journalist and activist who's focused for the past 20 years on Snake River salmon, the Lower Snake Dams, and most recently, the endangered Chinook salmon dependent southern resident orcas of the Salish Sea. He's the author of Recovering a Lost River, Removing Dams, Rewilding Salmon, Revitalizing Communities. And he's also the scriptwriter of the 2019 documentary, Damned to Extinction. He will be reflecting on his ups and downs as an activist, explaining the situation with the Lower Snake and speaking some truth about the environmental crisis we find ourselves in, in the midst of this major human caused extinction event. I believe he's also going to offer us some hope and incentive to keep doing all we can do to support the interdependent web of all life of which we are a part. Steve, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Our opening hymn is For the Beauty of the Earth. Joy of human care. 
gentle thoughts and mild. Source of all to Thee we raise, this our hymn of grateful praise. Every year, Pacific salmon migrate from their home stream to the sea and back again. This incredible journey can be hundreds or even thousands of miles long. During their migration, salmon play an important role in the health and stability of ecosystems, making them a keystone species. Their long journey starts here, in a riverbed, where thousands of tiny eggs have been laid in a gravel nest called a red. The eggs remain in the gravel throughout the winter while the embryos develop. In late winter or early spring, eggs hatch and the alevins emerge. These tiny fish live off the nutritious yolk sacs that hang off their stomachs. During this stage, they stay under the cover of their gravel nests. Despite this relative safety, many things can still harm salmon in their early stages of life. Rising water temperatures and predators such as blue herons, osprey, and kingfishers. They will not leave the protection of the gravel until their yolk is used up in about 12 weeks. At that time, the young salmon called fry swim up to the surface, gulp air to fill their swim bladders, and begin to feed. Too weak to travel upstream, the little fry stream. Along the way, they stop at calmer pools to rest and feed on zooplankton and small bugs. Some species immediately head out to sea, while others spend up to two years in fresh water. Migrating to sea is a long and arduous journey. The young salmon will spend this time avoiding predators and imprinting the smells of their home stream into their memory. Eventually, they make their way towards an estuary. Estuaries are where fresh water and salt water meet. This brackish water provides many nutrient-rich foods for growing salmon. Here, young salmon undergo many changes to transition from living in fresh water to salt water. This process is known as smoltification. During smoltification, salmon develop a dark back, a light belly, and will change to have silvery colors. This coloring will help them hide in the open ocean. Smolts seek deeper water and avoid light, and their gills and kidneys begin to change so they can process salt water. Young fish remain in the estuaries and tidal creeks, feeding on small fish, insects, crustaceans, and mollusks. Meanwhile, older fish gradually move into deeper, saltier water until they enter the ocean. Some salmon remain in coastal waters. Others travel thousands of miles through the open ocean. Depending on the species, they will stay at sea for one to seven years. As they travel, they will feed on animals such as fish, squid, eels, and shrimp. These ocean adults have grown larger and stronger in order to prepare for their difficult journey home. This journey begins when they are ready to spawn, and they are guided back by the smells of their home stream. On their way back to the estuary, they will have to navigate past fishers and predators such as porpoises, sharks, and seals. Those that do make it back to the estuary will face many obstacles in their battle upstream, such as waterfalls, dams, and even more predators. When migrating adults reach freshwater, they stop eating. During the remainder of their journey, their bodies prepare to reproduce. They change color from a silver to a brown, green, or red depending on the species. The males of some species develop a hook snout, a hump back, and elongated teeth. This transformation occurs to attract potential mates and to defend spawning territory. Upon reaching their natal stream, females build nests. They turn on their side and use their tails to dislodge stones or pebbles. Males fight with other males for spawning rights with a female. The dominant male will court a female and she will lay her eggs in the nest while the male will fertilize them with milk. The female then covers the nest with loose gravel and moves upstream to prepare another red. After swimming hundreds or even thousands of miles to get here and having completed their quest, the salmon's energy is completely drained. Most die within a few days of spawning. While the journey of these salmon has come to a close, 
The nutrients from their decomposing bodies will fertilize the stream and provide food for insects and microorganisms, nourishing the next generation of salmon. Bears, wolves, otters, birds, and other animals bring nutrient-rich droppings as well as uneaten parts of salmon into the forest, helping to fertilize the surrounding land. Pacific salmon have been nourishing our cultures, economies, and ecosystems for millions of years. The choices we make today affect salmon and all of the species that depend on them. Visit www.fisheries.noaa.gov to learn how you can be a salmon steward and ensure the cycle continues. Sometimes life can seem very large, overwhelming, and futile. It's easy to feel like one of those little fry facing a vast journey with impossible odds all alone. But the story of the salmon suggests that we're not all alone. Rather, we're each part of a larger truth beyond our awareness. And our journey is not linear. We live in cycles we can't always comprehend, cycles that intertwine to form the fabric of life. That is, to nurture any form of life is to nurture ourselves because our separation is only an illusion. Can you see the people, creatures, and even the plants around you as part of your own self? What might you do to nurture the lives around you? Can you embrace the small part of the great journey to which you've been entrusted? Thank you for listening. The best way I know to begin to grasp the seriousness and scope of the Northwest Salmon Crisis is to sit down in a quiet place and try to imagine the mysterious movement across the black waters of pre-creation of the Spirit of God. Imagine a quickening that pierces the Pacific, the entire ocean suddenly invested with being suddenly restless, inhaling and exhaling the moon coat's breaths called tides. Limb this vast being with glaciers in the north, volcanic fissures in its depths, imbue it with the same blue, gray, and green surfaces and glass smooth to mountainous textures as the Pacific. Same molten to frozen temperature ranges, same unknowable 36,000 foot depths, the same power to produce wonder, terror, beauty, death, and life. Imagine this being is your biological mother because in a very real sense, she is. Imagine the sun is your biological father because in equally real life-giving ways, he is. Imagine that after the spirit of God touched them, your distant but brilliant father and 17 million square mile mother not only fell in love, but began making love. Imagine ocean and sun in Coletus for eternity, because they are. Imagine your ocean mother's wounds are countless, that her fecundity is infinitely varied, and that her endless slow lovemaking with sun brings about countless gestations and births and infinity of beings, great blue whales and great white sharks, endless living castles of coral, vast phalanxes of fish, incalculable flocks of birds, gigantic typhoons, weather patterns the size of continents, because it does. Now turn your imagination inland toward North America. Follow the cloud banks into the mountains and up against them. See how every raindrop and snowflake, every skyborne molecule of H2O that falls upon the Rockies, Sierras, Sawtooths, Cascades, Bitterroot, Salmon Rivers, Clearwaters, Blues, is also a child of ocean and sun a literal offspring. See how when sun and ocean's liquid offspring congeal, obey gravity, and start back down the slopes toward their mother, 
The result is every life-giving trickle, crick, and river in the land. See how those streams and rivers are running past our feet and out to sea, then rising up in great tapestries of gravity-defying vapor to blow and flow back over us in oceans of cloud, fall once more upon the slopes as rain and snow, then congeal and start seaward, forming the perpetual prayer wheels we call watersheds. by Nespers tribal member Jamie Pinkham. Quote, we need to learn to live within the limits of the land. Today, resource management and political decisions seem to be focused on the convenience of people. This makes us avoid those gut-wrenching, difficult decisions about national resources. The concern I have is that if we turn our backs on the salmon, we turn our backs on confronting those issues that deal with the health of the river system. There is a lot of talk about ecological indicators. For instance, there has been a controversy over the spotted owl. The controversy was not about the spotted owl, but about whether or not the existence of old growth forests was something worth saving. It just so happens that one of the things that defines the health and integrity of old growth forest is the existence of the spotted owl. We need to look at the owls and the salmon as the miners' canaries. We flippantly seem to be willing to discard one resource, then another and another. Where does it all end? Unquote. Jamie Pinkham in Salmon and His People, 1999 by... Dan Landeen and Alan Pinkham. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here this Sunday morning. So um, I'll confess here at the outset that the title of this talk might scan a little bit grim. And I'll warn you, it might start out that way. But I promise to finish on a high note. First, the bad news. Here we are on the front end of a horrific human-caused calamity the sixth great extinction caused by our species' insistence on burning fossil fuels. According to a 2019 report issued by the United Nations, the average abundance of native species in most major land habitats has fallen by at least 20%, mostly since 1900. We've lost more than 40% of amphibian species and almost a third of reef-forming corals. More than a third of all marine mammals are threatened a worldwide decline in total numbers of birds may be as bad as an overall one-third reduction. 
At least 680 vertebrate species have been driven to extinction since the 16th century, and at least a thousand more are still threatened. Such numbers tend to be mind and heart numbing in the same way that the total number of deaths from COVID-19 are tragic in a too abstract way. Until you know someone who died, you miss the sound of her voice, the gentleness of his spirit, the visit that was on the calendar you can't yet bear to cross out. Extinction can be personal, at least for some of us, in the same way that the death of a loved one can be, except as poet Gary Snyder has pointed out, extinction is worse in at least one way. He observed that, and I quote, the end of life is one thing, the end of birth quite another. Extinction is death without the hope of rebirth. Extinction, in other words, is forever, and that stinks. As horrific as it is to reckon with that fact, it's important to grapple with the somber reality that extinction, both intentional and accidental, is a long running project of modern humans. It has a particularly grievous history with European cultures. The bears that used to wander around the outskirts of London were wiped from the face of the earth. <laughs> Hang on a second. Were wiped from the face of the earth around the 12th century. We are reminded in Richard Powers' elegiac novel, The Overstory, that a European blight wiped out one of North America's more majestic species of trees. A little more than a century ago, nearly four billion American chestnut trees were growing in the eastern US. They were among the largest, tallest, and fastest growing deciduous trees anywhere. The wood was rot resistant, straight grain, and suitable for furniture, fencing, and building. The nuts fed billions of animals and many people until a blight fungus ended the American chestnut. Now this tree's extinction has been called the greatest ecological disaster to strike the world's forests in all of history. This tree survived all adversaries for 40 million years and then disappeared within 40. Wiping out 4 billion trees can be construed as an inadvertent tragedy an accident of then poorly understood pathogens. But a premeditated sadistic kind of cruelty also pervades our history. In June of, <clears throat> in June of 1521, 500 years ago this month, Hernan Cortez ransacked Tenochtitlan. Only a year before, he and his men found themselves in awe what they, of what they witnessed in the Aztec cities of Mexico. What Cortez's men saw was so beautiful, they asked each other repeatedly if what they were looking at was real. Shimmering like a mirage in the blinding sun, nestled in between lakes at an elevation of over 7,000 feet, they saw a city, Tenochtitlan, now Mexico City, that many of them regarded as more stunningly beautiful than anything back home lovingly tended gardens of fruit trees, vegetables, and flowers, irrigated by a sophisticated water delivery system, intricately engineered, exquisitely clean, whitewashed streets, colors and textures laid out to please the human eye and form and function, wild birds nesting comfortably in the open city. Cortez was impressed, but he had something other than wonder or beauty on his mind. He was after gold, and by his own admission, he turned to slaughter when it became apparent he wouldn't get it. Among the signature touches of his utter insanity, his blind rage, was burning aviaries that contained, according to Cortez's own account, every variety of birds known in that country. So let's visualize this. These aviaries at the center of what, mis at, of what many historians consider to be one of the most beautiful cities in the history of the world, adjacent to the palace of Montezuma, must have been animated with hundreds of wild birds, parrots, egrets, herons, wrens, hummingbirds, doves, grackles, finches, woodpeckers. A swirl of color and flight. Wrote Cortez, although it grieved me much, 
Yet, as I manifest, it grieved the enemy more. I determined to burn these palaces, whereupon they manifested great sorrow. And he continues, considering that the inhabitants of this city were rebels and that they discovered so strong a determination to defend themselves or perish, I inferred two things. First, that we should recover little of the wealth of which they had deprived us. And second, that they had given us occasion and compelled us utterly to exterminate them. Barry Lopez writes of this macabre event that it was at its dark heart, a fundamental lapse of wisdom in the European conquest of America, an underlying trouble in which political conquest, personal greed, revenge, and national pride outweigh what is innocent, beautiful, serene, and defenseless, the birds. What Cortez and his men could not immediately possess, much less understand, they chose to destroy. These men set a bleak precedent. It's apparent to many historians, David Standard, for example, in his book, American Holocaust, that 500 years later, it's possible to trace the threads of Cortez's catastrophic mindset to the present. Here's just one thread. The London-based news organization, The Guardian, led reporting on a 2017 study that found just 100 corporations are responsible for 71% of the emissions that are threatening our existence with climate chaos. It seems to me one of the most obvious common threads between Cortez and, say, Exxon is this. The authority, in Exxon's case, the rapacious money aggregator called a corporation by which it has destroyed so much is a fraud, a legal fiction. Just as destructive a lie is the false authority by which Cortez burned the aviaries at Tenochtitlan, the crown and the church. So this is where the prospect of extinction for me starts to get personal. Having grown up witnessing the destruction of so much having studied the roots of destructive systems from conquistadors to corporations, and having grown up going to church on Sundays, early in my adulthood, I came to believe that any fraud would eventually be trumped by any truth. I still believe that, but it's the interval of eventually that has presented us with such a challenge. To bring things closer to home, I have always thought that eventually, we will save salmon in at least some of the rivers hereabouts that so many of us love. Around here, hope is a thing with fins, perhaps as much as it was a thing with feathers for the Aztecs of Tenochtitlan. But for the past three quarters of a century, hang on a second, when the pictures come up, they they hide my script, so I'll, you'll have to bear with me for just a second. Uh, around here, hope is a thing with fins, perhaps as much as a thing with feathers for the Aztecs of Tenochtitlan. But for the past three quarters of a century, we have witnessed a terminally corrupt branch of our own federal government destroy what was until recently. The river in the world that produced more Chinook salmon than any other on earth a cabal of agencies staffed by a most unfortunate combination of thugs and spineless bureaucrats has nearly succeeded in a black hearted endeavor as insanely evil as the burning of the aviaries at the center of Tenochtitlan, damning our beloved Columbia so thoroughly that salmon are nearly gone. Now here's a personal, personal extinction confessional. I am, by some measure, a failed environmentalist. By that, I mean I am, and we are, losing a war in spite of some inspiring battles where we've prevailed. I should mention that while I'm not fond of losing, whether it's a round of gin rummy around a campfire or my placement in a 5K run, this loss is orders of magnitude beyond the inadequate sports and military metaphors I've just resorted to. As Barry Lopez asks in the preface to his last book, Horizons, 
how will we survive the future we have so recklessly devised for ourselves? It's a daunting question, one that wisely Lopez does not answer directly in this otherwise good read. And perhaps because I'm a far more foolish writer than Barry was, I'll attempt to answer it here. So this was billed as a sermon about love, and somehow I've gotten halfway through it without mentioning the word until now. I said earlier, I believe that an insistence on truth will eventually overcome any lie, fraud, or falsehood. And I said, I still believe that's true. And I said, I've been frustrated by the biblical epic of time and that eventuality. So lately, I've been wondering if love might expedite the work of the truth, if love isn't in some way an accelerant for truth, love's proverbial third rail. So now you see I've run out of lame sports metaphors and I'm turning to train analogies. Now, of course, I believe whether or not love can serve this function, we should love anyway, just as we should strive for the truth. But just as there's no strict formula for the truth, there isn't one for love either. This makes it really hard to predict what love might accomplish in the strict utilitarian sense. Love, like much of life itself, is an ongoing improvised experiment, a blind date. So the answer, or the easy answer, to the question of whether we can save ourselves in the nick of time or otherwise is, who the hell knows? But if we are all living in the throes of a rather uncontrolled experiment, better to get on with the experimentation. Improvise, as any musician or poet or master craftsperson is apt to do. Here then are some improvised ideas on love and some, some, some suggestions for how love might help us beyond the anxiety and despair and sadness of our time. Some of you may remember the Bible verse from Corinthians, love bears all things. What if the meaning of the verb in that sentence were to change? What if it was more evocative of a thing with fur than a burden to lug around? Is it possible that one kind of love we might strive for has teeth and claws, at least in this figurative sense? We activists need at times to be as ferocious in defense of our homes as a mother grizzly is in defense of her cubs. We need look no further for this kind of ferocity than the fine examples coming out of First Nations communities all over the continent. Last Monday, thousands of people of all walks of life gathered in Minnesota to prevent yet another pipeline from desecrating sacred lands. As it was with the campaign to kill the Keystone XL pipeline, this campaign was organized and led by Native Americans, in this case, Anishinaabe people. We saw a similar fierce organizing spirit pervading the camp at Standing Rock. What stands out in these campaigns is not only their commitment to confront powerful enemies, but an even stronger resolve to stick to the principles of nonviolence. At Standing Rock, when a mole from the camp of fossil fuel security goons tried to incite violence as protesters placed their bodies yet again in harm's way, this mole was cold like a diseased cow from a healthy herd. He was steered toward a creek bed by three brave soldiers and bravely summarily disarmed. This style of bearing witness an unyielding commitment to speak and act out truth to power, as strong as the promise to refrain from resorting to violence, is expediting the defeat of our addiction to fossil fuel. And it has been deployed in the fight to free the world's greatest salmon river from its dams. On Indigenous Peoples Day in 2019, I was among a privileged few who witnessed Jode Gaudi, a tribal leader uh, Yakima tribal leader and scholar, stand at the site of drowned Celilo Falls to deliver a 45-minute speech that traced a direct line from the fraudulent land claims made by British and Spanish explorers under the scam of a theory called 
the doctrine of discovery. And he drew this line to the destruction of the Columbia salmon at the death wall of federal dams. Joe Day devoted the last and best part of his speech to a modest proposal. The time has come to begin planning for the removal of not just some dams on the river his people call Nchiwana, but all of them. Because of the premise upon which these dams were built was federal ownership of the river, and that claim is based in fraud, the only route to justice is to set the river free. Joe Day was a bear that afternoon. The truth had been spoken and heard by those with ears to hear. There are ferocious bears acting out of love, of course, everywhere you look for them, including right here in Moscow, right here in this virtual church service. I would be remiss not to mention Lynn Lawhey and Borg Hendrickson, you all probably know most of what they accomplished in the fight against big oil. The first time I met Lynn in the summer of 2010, he was organizing an evening of raucous resistance to the proposal of some Imperial oil representatives. Imperial, a Canadian subsidiary, subsidiary of Exxon, arrived in the town of Kuski to announce the coming of tar sands oil infrastructure to the wild and scenic Clearwater River corridor. When Lynn requested that the Imperial executive answer a few questions and listen to a few choice comments, one of them said they couldn't. Didn't have a PA system, they said. I've got one, Lynn told them. And so that night, these lap dogs left with their tails between their legs. And eventually those giant trucks Exxon wanted to run up the Clearwater Corridor went away. I like to think it was the beginning of the end for Exxon. Look at what's happened to them since. What was then the world's largest corporation is now teetering on the brink of insolvency. Their board of directors was just pirated by a group of shareholders insistent upon the company's quick transformation to a purveyor of renewable energy. Keystone XL pipeline is dead. Back then, we might not have bet on this outcome, but we didn't worry about outcomes. We operated under a principle perhaps best described by Martin Luther King. He wrote, and I quote, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. And led by Lennon Borg, we were ferocious in our defense of this place. And that helped put a much wider swath of the world on the road to a much better place. So from where does this fierce sense of unconditional unyielding love for one's home derive? Ultimately, I think it comes from beauty. Not only beauty, but the act of perceiving it. Harvard scholar Elaine Scarry wrote a book, on, a book called On Beauty and Being Just. Among the other truths in it, she describes how the perception of beauty can be a selfless act and how that can engender compassion. And that this premise, compassion arising out of a perception of the beautiful leads to some even more generous ideas about justice and fairness and equality. I happen to think the act of seeing beauty is responsible for even more, maybe even for language itself. So think about this. You're part of a clan of early humans. No one is speaking because they can't. Words haven't been invented. Life has been a struggle up to this point. You have to find things to eat while not being eaten. Clothes and shelter take much more effort than a swipe of a credit card or a loan from the bank. But finally, your clan is getting ahead. It's late summer, sunset over the broad savanna, mountains off in the western distance. There's enough food to relax for a bit, secure enough shelter to drift off into a deep sleep and enjoy the magic carpet ride of good dreams. The kids have invented another game with rocks and sticks and are entertaining themselves. 
The men are grunting and scratching and scheming for another crack at getting some meat. The women are multitasking, sorting seeds they've gathered, one eye on the kids, another on the sunset. One woman is overcome by the scene, the innocent playfulness of children, the monosyllabic goofy grunts and guffaws of the men, the sunset, the tall grass waving in the breeze, trees silhouetted at the far edge of the grass, mountains touching the sun as it sinks into the earth, purple eastern sky leading the advancing edge of a star-studded night. She quietly hums a tune. Of course, we could sing before we could talk, but there's a yearning finally to express more than a melody can convey. She says something. What was that first word? I'm not gonna tell you. You'll have to imagine that one for yourself. All we have, wrote Edward Abbey, is beauty and the love that beauty inspires. If this is true, the act of defending our sacred places is no longer merely a contest with outcomes where pundits and other bystanders can conveniently label winners and losers. All there is is the truth that when beautiful people, places, and things are compromised, cut down, strip mined, or plugged up, with the callous disregard of a corporation or the malevolent insanity of someone like Cortez, we've all lost. Some of what we lose can't be brought back. An irretrievable loss and the darkness accompanying it ultimately is yet another reason to contemplate the vitality of love in an age of extinction. I made a movie a few years ago about the relationship between salmon and some orchids that swim around in the Eastern Pacific. These killer whales evolve to hunt and eat Chinook salmon and they have a language of their own and hunting strategies they teach to their young to catch Chinook. At the premiere of this movie in Seattle, a then 12 year old handed me a sharp cutting poem about loss, about the justifiable anger so many young people have about their predecessors, wiping out a vast garden and leaving little more than a dirty outhouse for the next generation. It was a bleak poem about a world without beauty. I told this young woman that her poem disturbed me and that I would write her a poem back in response. And this turned out to be a kind of foolish promise. It took me so long to fulfill it. I worry I did not allay any of this girl's fears about the trustworthiness of her parents' generation. I'm not much of a poet and even less so on demand. But like any experienced writer, I'm a fairly accomplished thief. I rearranged the species that is the subject of Stephen Scafaldi's poem, The Last American Buffalo. His is ultimately a poem about what we owe our non-human companions in our journey here on earth. So I've been meaning to write Scafaldi to tell him that if we are truly on the brink of the sixth great extinction on our planet, that he could take his excellent poem and my cheap ripoff of it, and that could be the start of a literary franchise. In truth, I hope neither he nor I ever has to write a last American salmon poem. So to wrap things up, and with apologies to Stephen Scafaldi, here's my song for this bereaved girl. It's called The Last American Killer Whale. Because words dazzle in the dizzy light of things and the soul is like an animal, hunted and slow, this killer whale swims through me every night as if I was some kind of sea and hunkers against the cold dark, breaching under the stars while the fog of its breathing rises in the air. And it is the loneliest feeling I know to approach it slowly with my hand outstretched to tenderly touch the sleek black skull and stroke that place huge between its eyes, where what I think and what it thinks are one singing thing. So quiet that when I wake, I seldom remember swimming beside it and whispering in its ear quietly passing the miles. 
the two of us, as if Sitka or the lights of San Francisco were our unlikely destination. And sometimes ships pass us and no one leans out hard in the dark, aiming to end us. And so we continue on. Somehow when today, while the seismic quietness of the earth spun beneath my feet, and while the world, I guess, carried on, that lumbering thing moved heavy and thick and dark through the dreams I believe we keep having, whether we sleep or not. And when you see it, again say, I'm sorry for the things you didn't do, and then offer it some salmon and tell it stories you remember from the star chamber of the womb, or at least the latest joke, something good to keep it company, as otherwise it doesn't know. You are here for love, and like the world tonight, doesn't really care whether we live or die. Tell it you do and why. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve, for being with us and for sharing your, your thoughts, your words, the, the poem, the, the whole experience. Um, it was deeply, deeply moving and we're very grateful for your presence with us here today. We do have um, uh, one last hymn to sing. This is The Oneness of Everything. the reaches of the mind. There find the key to nature's harmony in an architecture so
Chinook Blessing. We call upon the earth, our planet home, with its beautiful depths and soaring heights, its vitality and abundance of life. And together we ask that it teach us and show us the way. We call upon the mountains, the Cascades and the Olympics, the high green valleys and meadows filled with wildflowers, the snows that never melt, the summits of intense silence, and we ask that they teach us and show us the way. We call upon the waters that rim the earth, horizon to horizon, that flow in our rivers and streams, that fall upon our gardens and fields, and we ask that they teach us and show us the way. We call upon the land which grows our food, the nurturing soil, the fertile fields, the abundant gardens and orchards, and we ask that they teach us and show us the way. We call upon the forests, the great trees reaching strongly to the sky with earth in their roots and the heavens in their branches, the fir and the pine and the cedar, and we ask them to teach us and show us the way. We call upon the creatures of the fields and forests and the seas, our brothers and sisters, the wolves and deer, the eagle and dove, the great whales and the dolphin, the beautiful orca and salmon who share our Northwest home. And we ask them to teach us and show us the way. We call upon all those who have lived on this earth, our ancestors and our friends, who dreamed the best for future generations and upon whose lives our lives are built. And with thanksgiving, we call upon them to teach us and show us the way. And lastly, we call upon all that we hold most sacred, the presence and power of the great spirit of love and truth, which flows through all the universe to be with us just and show us the way. And now we join in our sung benediction, there is a love. <laughs>